Welcome to Southside Church Online Services. My name is Grant, and I get to lead Southside Church alongside my wife and our incredible congregation here in the deep south of Cape Town, South Africa. Welcome if it's your first time, um, and if it is, we would love you to go and check out our website at www.southsidechurch.co.za, and it would be great if you would fill in a connection card there so that we could get in contact with you and maybe navigate a bit of the journey with you into the future. Today, I want us to begin by drawing our attention and our focus to Jesus. And um, I'm reminded of a portion of Scripture in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11 to 16 in the Old Testament, where a man called Elijah is in a season of depression and darkness. He's been threatened with death, and he is seeking God's deliverance. He begins to seek God and position himself to hear God. And in the midst of a moment, he experiences this fury of fire. Then there's the manifestation and power of an earthquake that trembles. And then a mighty wind that moves across uh, the place in which he's standing. But God's deliverance was not in the form of any of those mighty manifestations. In fact, that portion of Scripture tells us that it was the power of God's Word in a whisper that began to reorder the course of Elijah's life toward his deliverance. The power of one word from God, not needing to be manifest in the loud sounds of fire, wind, or an earthquake. And in a season like this, there are many loud experiences that are overwhelming us. There are the winds of the unknown blowing through our minds and our thoughts about what tomorrow holds. There's the fury of our fears and, and the fire that's manifesting in our families, in our finance, and uh, in our futures. But what if the power of God's deliverance in the midst of all these manifestations that seem mighty is the Word of God being whispered in your heart? For you and I right now, God's promise is that He will never leave us or forsake us, that no weapon forged against us shall prosper. The whisper of His voice calls for you to trust Him when the manifestation of your fears are in a furious fire or a mighty wind or the shaking of the ground beneath you. And so let us pause because he says in his word, be still and know that I'm God. Let us hear the whisper of God's confirmation that we fight from victory and not for victory. And then let us press into his presence with our praise this morning. So what I want us to do is Pause for two minutes, and you're going to join me, and I'm going to take you through this. And then as that two-minute period is up, we're going to enter into the presence of God with our praise this morning. So where you are right now, would you close your eyes? Put both feet on the ground if you're sitting. Open your hands as though you're in a, in a position or posture of surrender before your good Father. And where you are, close your eyes with me. Be still. As your shopping list races through your head, let it pass by like a cloud in the sky. Be still. In this moment, exist being present without the labels that define you by your doing or the responsibilities you carry as father, mother, boss, CEO, businessman. Strip it all off and exist in this moment as a child of God, made in His image, loved by Christ Jesus, who proved His love by what He did for you on the cross. So you've got to do nothing but be still. I pray as we're still for these two minutes that, Holy Spirit, you would bring a peace to our hearts and allow us to hear the whisper of God who will direct us to deliverance. Jesus name at your word I will go even when it leads me to the unknown 
And as I step out in faith, I know my God will make a way. Let's sing it together. At your word, I will go, even when it leads me to the unknown. And as I step out in faith, I know my God will make a way. You're the way maker, oh, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. At your word, at your word, I will go, even when it leads me to the unknown, and as I stay. Father God, I thank you that you say that your word will accomplish all you have sent it to do. And I thank you that as we choose to go in alignment with your word, 
you will accomplish all you have for our lives regardless of our circumstances because your word will always accomplish what it's been sent to do. I pray, Father, that you would make a way, that you would release your promises, that you would bring us the light where we need it in the season of our lives as we've lifted our sight to you, surrendered to your Lordship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to continue in this attitude of worship through the privilege of returning our tithe, giving back to God the first 10% of our monthly income in alignment with His Word. And so as we go and we give God the first and best of what He's already provided us, um, we trust that He will continue to be the one that goes before us, making the path straight and providing wherever we might be in fear of lack, especially in the season. And um, something that we acknowledge uh, and often talk about at Southside Church is the fact that we more accurately live in spiritual seasons than just on the circumstances that we experience on the timeline of our humanity. And so instead of just getting overwhelmed with the circumstances in our humanity, we ask ourselves, what spiritual season is this that I'm in? And seasons come and go. Seasons are not life sentences. They come and go. We have summer, winter, autumn, spring. In the same way, spiritual seasons go in and out. And the seasons in which we experience God's abundance, a harvest, but there are also seasons, seasons in which by faith we need to be sowing and letting go of what's in our hands. And as we get the privilege of giving to God financially today, it might feel very difficult to let go of what's in our hands because we feel like we're living with lack in this lockdown. We might have lost a job or we might be getting paid less and we're going, oh God, you're still wanting me to let go of what's in my hand in this season where I feel like the seed I'm holding is all I've got and I've got none in storage once this is gone. But let me remind you that the seed you sow in one season will determine the harvest you embrace in the next. And there is a harvest that will come as we remain faithful in sowing. In fact, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 to 9, it says, Make no mistake about it, God will never be mocked, for what you plant will always be the very thing you harvest. The harvest you reap reveals the seed that was planted. And I want you to reflect on this question, as you get the privilege of putting God first with your finance, of tithing, of sowing your seed in the season we find ourselves in. What seed are you planting in this season that you will be able to harvest in the next? As you process answering that, if you're going, God, I want your blessing. I want to know that you go before me, that there's a harvest. How are you going to let go by faith of the very seed you're trying to hold on to in fear? May God bless you and keep you as you remain faithful in your giving today. You will see that the giving... Um, Details have come up on the screen, and you can EFT or you can even snap scan if you want to as we get to give this morning. Cool. So today is week two of um, uh, two fiery Sundays with friends. Last week we heard Jared Smith, a good friend um, and a great leader, and he spoke into listening to God in the season. Today we have um, uh, Pastor Leanne Greef, Pastor Leanne Greef and her husband, Pastor Andre. They are the lead pastors for View Church in uh, Table View. They're incredible leaders, amazing communicators. And as Southside Church has been growing as a baby church, only two years old now, uh, Pastor Leanne has preached into our house. Their church has spoken and given us leadership insight and assistance as we've navigated and seen God do these great things in our community. And so it's such a privilege to have good friends back, to speak and bring the fire this morning. And so we're going to hear Pastor Leanne preaching about waiting well in this season. And I listened to that sermon, spoke directly to me. My prayer is that today you would open your heart to receive the powerful message God 
has for you in such a time as this through Pastor Leanne Kreef. So let's prepare our hearts as Pastor Leanne brings the message this morning. Hey everybody, I'm so glad we get to spend this day with you. It's Sunday, the best day of the week for sure. And um, I want to encourage you, if you are watching this service on a social media platform, um, why don't you share it on your page? Because that's going to enable other people to hop on and watch as well. And um, can I be completely honest with you guys? I am missing preaching to a, a live audience. I miss um, the amens and I miss the responses. And so I think the best way that we can sort of create that in this environment is please use your, your comment button on your social media and you know if you agree write amen that's not some weird super spiritual word it just means i agree let it be so or give us a, a hands up or a thumbs up or you know but let's interact the service is that good so i think we all deserve a bit of a pat on the back and i think that most of us are really waiting on something in the season would you guys agree this is really a season of waiting and I know some people, they cannot wait for their first run along the beachfront. Some people cannot wait for their first surf in the sea. I know that Andre is frothing to get back in the sea. Some people cannot wait to go back to an office and actually work from an office. And um, I think all of the parents watching can give a thumbs up or an amen. When I say a lot of parents are waiting for those amazing creatures we call teachers who are so undervalued and should get a massive pay increase and all the teachers said amen. We can't wait for them to get back to work and educate our children because they do a phenomenal job. Um, but yeah, whatever phase of life you're in, we're all waiting on something, especially in this season. Would you guys agree? Can I get an amen on your comments page if you agree? We're all waiting on something. This is a, a season of waiting. And so today, I wanted to preach into the season. If, if you and I are going to be in a season of waiting, how do we wait well? And so if you're taking notes, and I want to encourage you to take notes, um, the title of today's sermon is How to Wait Well. But we're going to open up in prayer. Our Holy Spirit, I just thank you that you are here. You are present. I pray that every word that I speak will be anointed by you. I pray you'll speak to me and through me. I thank you that none of us will leave unchanged by your word, by the power of your word. I pray you'll have your way in our hearts that you would draw people to yourself. I pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation and all of God's people said, Amen. Awesome. So we're going to get into this. How do we wait well? Well, the first thing I believe we need to do in order to wait well is we need to focus on who we are waiting on and not what we are waiting on. You guys got that? We need to focus on who we are waiting on and not what we are waiting on. And Isaiah chapter 40 verse 27 says this, O Jacob and Israel, why do you say my way is hidden from the Lord? My God does not think about my cause. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The God who lives forever is the Lord, the one who made the ends of the earth. He will not become weak or tired. His understanding is too great for us to begin to know. He gives strength to the weak and he gives power to him who has little strength. Even very young men get tired and become weak and strong young men trip and fall. But they who wait upon the Lord will get new strength. They will rise up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired and they will walk and not become weak. Guys, I want to ask you today, who are you waiting on? You know, as Christians, we're waiting on our God. The creator of heaven and earth, 
the one who spoke the world into being, the one who is in ultimate control. We're in good hands. Would you guys agree? The king of the universe has our backs. We're in good hands. You know, I can remember when I was a little girl in grade one. This is one of those embarrassing stories. But I was in grade one and I had a really bad lift. Okay, so it was a really bad one. And uh, my school picked it up and they referred me to a speech therapist. The school actually had an in-house speech therapist, which I'm really grateful for now, so many years later. But at the time, I wasn't so happy about being put in speech therapy. And the speech therapist would come and fetch me and she would take me out of my class and I'd have to go to this small little room where she worked. And, you know, my personality, I really wanted to be around people and I didn't want to miss out on any of the action. So I hated being pulled out of my class. And I think it also made me feel like there was something wrong with me. I had to go for speech therapy. And so one day at the age of six, I don't know what came over me, but I decided to tell my speech therapist that my parents and I had had a discussion and while we were very grateful for her help and her input, we had decided that speech therapy was a waste of my time and I would no longer be attending the sessions. I then thanked her again for all of her help, picked up my bag and toddled off back to my, to my grade one classroom, thinking very uh, gullibly, I guess, that that would be the end of the story. Well, it wasn't. And the speech therapist was clearly offended at being told by a six-year-old with a severe lisp that she was wasting her time. And the next minute I heard these footsteps coming down the passage and she actually got to my class before me. And then I realized, oh, oh. And she pulled my teacher aside and she was like, and she said this, I'm wasting her time. She said her parents don't want it. And she was getting upset and I could see my teacher was looking very awkward. And now I'm starting to panic like, oh flip, what have I done? And then I heard my teacher said this. She said, you know what? I'm going to phone her mother right now and I'm gonna find out what the situation is. And right there and then, even though I was feeling ashamed because I had lied and I was feeling scared and I knew that there would be consequences to my action, to my actions, the minute that I heard that my mother was gonna be involved, I felt this total peace. I just felt calm, my heart rate started to drop. And I want you, I want you to hear me today, church. I realized then and there that the person who loved me the most in the entire world, the person who I trusted the most, who always had my back, was now on the job. My mom was now on the job. And that gave me peace. And like I said, I knew there would be consequences. My mom was a strict mom, but a very loving mom. But just knowing that the one who had my back was on the job, gave me peace and church i want to encourage you today the one who loves you the most in the universe has your back he has my back our god is in control and he has our backs you and i are waiting on jesus who is jesus to you I asked this a few weeks ago. Is he someone that you just sing about once a week in a church service? Is he someone you quickly read about for three minutes while you're trying to get ready for work to ease your conscience? Or is he your savior? Is he the lover of your soul? The one who created you, who keeps track of the hairs of your head, the one who has a plan for you? Who is Jesus to you? Because the Bible says that he is all of those things and more. He's your comforter. He's your guide. In this period of waiting, you and I need to know who Jesus is so that we can fully understand who it is we are waiting on. And I want to say this, church, I think there's a lot of confusion without even realizing it. But you and I need to acknowledge today 
in this COVID-19 pandemic, we are not waiting on our government. We are not waiting on our president, although I am so grateful to God for him. And let's keep praying for him. Amen. You guys can light up the, the comments box. We need to carry on praying for him. He's done us so proud. I'm so proud of our president. But we are not waiting on our president. We are not waiting on scientists or medical doctors. We're not waiting on the economy. We are waiting on Jesus. And he is in control. The earth is his footstool. He's in control, church. It is good news. In seasons of waiting, you and I need to remember first who it is that we're waiting on. And we're waiting on Jesus. He's got our backs. Second way to wait well is you need to make sure that you don't allow worry to win. I'm going to say that again. When you're waiting well, you make sure that you don't allow worry to win. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, surely Anne, that is way easier said than done. And I acknowledge that. Okay. It's so easy in a, in a period of waiting, in a period like a, a COVID-19 pandemic to let the ifs and the buts swirl around in our heads and to make us anxious. I, I realize that. So how do we stop the worry? How do we fight worry? You and I fight worry with hope. You know, in other versions of Isaiah 40, it says, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Hope is a powerful, powerful weapon against worry. So what exactly is hope in the biblical sense? I really want you guys to get this today. Biblical hope is when God has promised us something and we are confident and we trust that he will fulfill his promise. Biblical hope is a confidence that something will come to pass because our God has promised it and he is faithful. That's what biblical hope is. And it's very different to the world's definition of hope. If we're just talking about hope from the English dictionary, you know, pre-lockdown, we may have said something like, Oh, the Proteas are playing on Saturday. Oh, I really hope they win. Oh, but it's going to be a tough game. And we'd kind of be implying by that word hope that yeah, maybe they have like a 50-50 chance of winning. The odds aren't really in their favor. You guys understand what I'm saying? There's a very big difference between the use of the, the use of the word hope in the normal English dictionary and biblical hope. Biblical hope is the total opposite. It's assurance, it's confidence, there's no doubt. And why is biblical hope so important? And I really felt God give me a personal revelation about this this week, and, and I pray you catch it too. You see, hope secures our future in God. When you and I have hope and we say, my God is who he says he is and he is faithful. We're saying my future is secured. So why is biblical hope so important? I really feel like God gave me a revelation about this. And so I'm trusting that you guys will catch this too. You see, biblical hope secures our future in God. When you and I say, God, I trust you and I fully believe that you are who you say you are and my life is in your hands. When we do that, we are surrendering to God's goodness. And that's a powerful place to be living your life from. If we don't have hope and our security is not in God's goodness, we are going to be anxious. We're going to worry. And church, you need to understand this. The worry and the anxiety is going to manifest itself in one of two ways. 
we're either going to become paralyzed by fear or we're obsessively going to try to control our environments and we end up becoming greedy and self-obsessed. And that can seem like a harsh thing to say, but that's the reality. In both scenarios, whether we're paralyzed by fear or whether we become obsessively controlling, it takes our eyes off others and we become fully focused on ourselves, our future, our outcome, our best interests, our problems, our potential. And you know what it effectively does? It takes us away from what we were created for. It takes us away from our purpose on this earth. Hear me, church. We were created to love God and to love people. If we're consumed by worry and, and, and focused on ourselves, we're unable to love others and to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. And that's what we were called to be on this earth. We're called to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Come on. I think this is a powerful, powerful sentence. Hope is the birthplace of Christian self-sacrificing love and the birthplace of surrender to God. I'm going to say that one more time. Hope is the birthplace of self-sacrificing love and the birthplace of surrender to God. In other words, when you and I are confident that God is taking care of us, that He's got us covered, and we're not obsessing about ourselves. We're free to think about others, to love others, to sow into others, to pray for others, to care for others, to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ because we know that our tomorrow is secure because Jesus has our back. People who are filled with hope say this, Lord, I just want to be there for other people today. I just want to be there for other people tomorrow. And I know that you'll take care of me today. And you'll take care of me tomorrow. Amen? Is that good? Hope is powerful. So how do we grow in hope? You might be saying, awesome, Leanne, that's great. I don't want to live in worry and anxiety. I want to live in hope, but I don't know how to get this hope. How does it work? I believe that we get hope when we grow our faith because hope and faith are a part of each other. And how do we grow our faith? We grow it from hearing the word of God and from getting in to worship. You know, in one of my toughest seasons personally, um, it was a season that involved some waiting. Andre and I actually um, had a miscarriage, so we lost our, our first baby, our first pregnancy. And I know it happens to a lot of people, and it's never a nice thing to go through, but for some reason it really knocked me for a six. I was working in the government at the time. I was doing 30 hour shifts every five days. So I was stressed, I was sleep deprived. Um, I got really excited about this baby and I think it was just a combination of the shock, um, the stress, the sleep deprivation. But when I had the miscarriage, I was knocked for a six and I've never felt so sad in my life. And of course, it put us into a season of waiting because we were praying and trusting God that I would fall pregnant again and we would have another baby. And you know, in that season, the devil saw an opportunity to mess with my mind. And I've never felt my mind so attacked like I did in that season. And the only way that I was able to get through that season was through God's word and worship. That was my lifeline. And you know, I can remember being at work on a 30 hour shift at three o'clock in the morning. I'd just come out of theater, taken off my scrubs, gone to the bathroom and just crying my eyes out and digging 
in my pocket and pulling out the scriptures that I had written for the call that God is for me, that he will never leave me nor forsake me, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then I had specific scriptures that I had found and written about my future children, about their health, about my legacy. And I remember standing there in the hospital bathroom crying, but just repeating God's word and his promises over my life. And it brought hope. I can remember driving home from the hospital, um, listening to worship and, and bawling my eyes out. And, you know, some days all I could say was Jesus, Jesus, as I cried out to him. But I'll never forget this. This whole, this whole season happened in a physical winter. So it was the middle of winter. And I can remember that I was arriving while well, I was getting up and, and leaving for work in the dark and arriving at the hospital in the dark and then I was leaving to drive home in the dark I was working long hours and we all know that the sun rises and rises later and sets early in winter and I can remember the one day driving home saying God I just can't wait for summer I want to see light and I remember saying and God I don't just want a physical summer I want a spiritual summer I want this season to be over I want the sadness to go I can't wait for summer you know what summer came summer came physically the sun came out earlier it set later and we were super blessed I got I fell pregnant with Juliana um, and had a, a healthy pregnancy yeah, she's the most beautiful little girl such a blessing but God was faithful and that summer came. And I really feel that there's some people today who need to hear this. You're going through a lot. Maybe it's financial loss. Maybe it's relationship problems. Maybe it's illness and you feel like you are barely holding on. I want to tell you, your summer is coming. Just hold on. This too shall pass you know they say it's always darkest at dawn just before the light shines through and I'm not a big acronym fan I, I think that they can be a little bit corny but I really like this one for hope it says hold on pain ends and I believe that's a word for some people today God is saying to you just hold on the pain will end. Your summer is coming. The light will shine through. Just trust me. I've got your back. Trust me. I love you. Psalm 30 verse 5. It says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Our God is a faithful God, and your breakthrough is coming. Amen. If you guys agree, come on, I want to see some amens on the chat page. Third and last point. If you and I are going to wait well, we need to realize that waiting is an active process. Church, there is nothing passive about waiting. What do I mean by that? I'm going to try and illustrate it with a story. So in 2017, there was this American football star, Jalen Hurts, and he was playing for the College of Alabama. He was the quarterback. He was the star. And it was the, the, the cha championship. So it was the final. And Alabama was playing against Georgia. And there were thousands. I think they, they packed hundreds of thousands of people into those stadiums. And this was a massive game. And Jalen fell to pieces. And he ended up being benched in that game. And what happened after that actually shocked the sporting world in America because he ended up getting benched for the next season. And the team went and bought a brand new quarterback to replace him. And that was quite a shock because he was a good player. He was an up and coming star. But how Jalen handled 
the year that followed is incredible. He didn't quit. He didn't try and get a transfer to another team. He didn't lie on his couch and get depressed, watching Instagram and, you know, seeing everybody else living their best life. Instead, Jalen went to the gym more than ever and worked harder than he'd ever worked before. Jalen pitched up at practices and put more in than he'd ever put in before. They even say mentally he stayed so strong and there's no surprise, he's a strong Christian, Jalen Hurts, you can Google him. Mentally, they say he would cheer on this new, this new quarterback, the, the new star of the team. He would cheer him on as he sat on the bench and, and, and his attitude was so good. You know what happened, church? Almost a year later, in December 2018, Alabama was playing Georgia in another final and that star quarterback got injured and Jalen had to come back onto the field in his place. And Alabama was being beaten quite badly. Jalen came on after being benched for a year and he played his heart out and people were shocked at the level of skill that he showed. They say he set up and scored the two plays um, that actually gave the team the points to go into the lead and win the final. And all of a sudden, Jalen was the biggest hero again in Alabama and he was back in his quarterback starting position. But why did that happen, church? Because in his season of waiting, he was active. There was nothing passive about how he waited. And I want to encourage you guys, even now we're in a season of waiting, there's, un, there, there's, there's unknown elements, even with phase four. I want to encourage you, when we wait well, we are not passive. Maybe your marriage is struggling. Maybe you don't normally spend so much time with your spouse. You know what? In the season of lockdown, in the season of waiting, why don't you be active and book some marriage counseling? Maybe you have lost your job. This is a season for you to say, God, please give me an innovation. How can I start something fresh? What new business opportunity or venture can I go into? Maybe you've still got your job, but it's not your dream job. This is the time for you to do an online course, um, extend your skills. Most importantly, if you've got more time on your hands, get into God's word, get strong, let him strengthen you. There is nothing passive about waiting well. Amen. If you're bored or depressed, in this lockdown state. I keep on bringing up how we can help the elderly, but you know, the widows and the orphans are so close to God's heart. If you've got an, an elderly neighbor, just phone them. You know, I know in stage four, they're still gonna have to stay in isolation. Phone them, care for them, shop for them. Do something. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. And then very important, if we're going to wait in an active manner, we need to make sure that every day we're putting on the armor of God. I'm going to read from Ephesians 6, verse 10 to 18. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you may take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. 
Church, are you guys aware that we are in a battle? Every single day we're in a spiritual battle, especially in a season of waiting. The devil wants to mess with your mind. He wants to get you disillusioned, bitter, and passive. So how do we fight that? I believe every day God wants us to get up and actively put on the armor of God. What does that look like? It's nothing weird. I try very hard to remember to do this every morning in my quiet time, and it looks like this. I say, Jesus, Today, I'm putting on the belt of truth. I'm reminding myself that I serve a God who is big and faithful, and you have my back, and you are in control. I'm taking up the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit is God's Word. And when the devil comes with lies, I will fight back with truth. God said he has plans to prosper me, not to harm me, to give me a hope and a future. God says that I am more than a conqueror. Isaiah 61 verse 7, God says that he will pay back a double portion for your former trouble. You know, this is a scripture I really felt like I needed to share with you guys today. Some people need to hear this today. Again, maybe you've gone through a season of loss now with COVID-19, financially, relationally. Our God is a God who restores. He can restore what you've lost like this. He's a supernatural God. And he says in his word, Isaiah 61 verse 7, he will give you a double portion for your former troubles, for your former loss. Some of you need to hold on to that promise in this season. Amen. Light up that comment box if you agree. Next, I pick up the shield of faith. I say, my God has got this. I will not doubt for a second. Then I put on the breastplate of righteousness. I remind myself that the only reason I can get up here and preach is because Jesus died on the cross for me. And now I get to wear his righteousness. I'm the righteousness of God. When the devil tells you you're not good enough, you're a sinner, you say, yes, I am. But Jesus paid the price and I get to wear the breastplate of righteousness. What I also love about the breastplate of righteousness is it protects your heart. It's so important to guard your heart. I try to remember every day, God, thank you that this breastplate is guarding my heart. I pray that I will have a soft heart and a thick skin, that I will be difficult to offend and quick to forgive. Then we put on the helmet of salvation. That's God's protection over our minds. And I say, God, thank you that I have the mind of Christ. I'm not going to let any old nonsense in my head, any just random thoughts the devil tries to pop in there. I have the mind of Christ. I am not going to let the devil trick me into believing that I'm a victim. I am not a victim. I'm a Christian. That means I'm a victor. Nobody owes me anything because Jesus gave me everything. Amen. We put on the helmet of salvation. And lastly, you put on the shoes of readiness. Come on, I love this. We've just said that, you know, in a time of waiting, there is nothing passive about waiting well. So we need to put the shoes of readiness on. And we read in Isaiah 40 a few minutes ago that those who wait upon the Lord will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. What a promise, church, with our God, even when we're waiting. If we're waiting on Him, we're actually running because there's a spiritual blessing. There's a spiritual favor. There's a maturing that happens and it propels us forward. I wanna encourage you today, whatever you are waiting on, if you are waiting on our God, you can know that there is strength, there is grace, there is progression, there is protection, and there is blessing. I wanna end off by reading Isaiah 30 verse 18. It says, yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. 
for the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. We're going to pray together. Father God, I just thank you that in this season of waiting, as we choose to wait on you, God, we are blessed. You are faithful and you are amazing. And Father God, I pray you will give all of us strength in this season to wait well. We choose to acknowledge that we are waiting on you, the King of the universe, the one who holds the world in his hand. God, we also choose in the season of waiting that we are going to fight worry with hope. God, we are going to anchor our lives in you, God. And Lord Jesus, as we live lives of hope, I thank you that we get to be your hands and your feet. Oh God, won't you come and empower us? And Father God, I just thank you that as we wait, God, there will be nothing passive about the way that we do it, God. We will be active for you. We will take ground for you. More people will be reached. More souls will be saved for you in Jesus' precious name. You know, if you are listening today and you don't actually have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to give your life to him. Maybe you've done it before and that was a while ago and you've fallen away. I want to give you an opportunity today to make Jesus Lord of your life. I asked you that question, who is Jesus to you? He wants to be your savior. He wants to be the one who has your back. He wants to be your best friend. He wants to be the one that you trust. And he wants all of his promises in his word to belong to you. And that's completely possible if you ask him to be Lord of your life. So if that's you, it's the best decision you could ever make. I'm going to pray a prayer and I'm going to ask you to repeat after me in your home or wherever you are. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross and paying the price for my sins. Today, I ask you to be Lord of my life. I repent for my sins and I choose to move forward, living a life that glorifies you. Thank you that you love me passionately. Thank you that you have a plan for me. Thank you that from now on, you will always have my back and I can live with hope. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. If you made that decision today to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, as Pastor Leanne guided you through, we would love to make further connection with you. And so your next step would be to go to our website, www.southsidechurch.co.za, and to just fill in the connection card there, and you can then put in the option that today you gave your life to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. We would love to connect with you further. And uh, for all of us today, as we prepare for next week launching our new series, um, uh, we want you this week to reflect on that portion of Scripture from Isaiah 40 that Pastor Leanne referred to. Those that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. And so you will see that we will send out a digital wallpaper on our Facebook page, on Instagram, and it will be a link on our website that you can go and upload and put on your digital device. And we encourage you every morning as you get up, first thing, pray back in declaration the words of Isaiah chapter 40 over yourself and over your family in these circumstances and situations we're in. That as we wait, we're not waiting on something, but on someone, as Pastor Leanne said. And so let's do that this week as we prepare for the super exciting new series coming up. So we'll see you next week, 8.30, for our online service at Southside Church. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May His face shine on you. May He go before you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen.